This video covers symbolization of biconditionals. Biconditionals are sentences which include the logical phrase if and only if and the logical synonyms for if and only if. It's symbolized using the double arrow. Of course, there are some textbooks which instead of double arrows use the triple bar. Triple bar and double arrow is the very same thing in logic. Before we start the actual sentences, let's look at a sample sentence. Janet will make jello if and only if it's Tuesday. Well, we see if and only if here, so we know we're going to have a double arrow. And the sentences on either side are merely Janet makes jello and it's Tuesday. So it's J double arrow T. Of course, the double arrow will be commutative, so it would be perfectly okay to put T double arrow J. The truth is, symbolization of double arrows could hardly be easier. If you know the synonym, typically you just put a double arrow exactly where it's going to go, and you don't even have to worry about the side on which you put the sentences. One other point that we can make is that a double arrow is really a symbol of convenience. We wouldn't have to have it in our system. Notice that if and only if is clearly composed of an if and an only if. So we could symbolize the sentence T arrow J, if it's Tuesday she'll make jello, and J arrow T, which is best read in this case as she'll make jello only if it's Tuesday. These three symbolizations are all logically equivalent. One other point that we should make before we look at the actual sentences, well, two points really. First of all, let's talk about what if and only if means. When you write J double arrow T, am I saying that J equals T? That's not the best way to think about it. I think the best thing to have in mind is mutual dependence. Mutual dependence. I can spell dependence. I know I can. That making jello depends on its being Tuesday, and Tuesday depends on making jello. Now, it seems a little odd to say that being Tuesday depends on making jello, but in terms of the meaning of this sentence, we're saying there's a dependency between these two events. Maybe another way to think about it is one to one correlation that the two parts correspond to each other. They are correlated, and so a correlation is a good way to think about things. One to one correlation, one to one correspondence. But now that sets up this next point that we need to make. Let me add, it's not true that in front of this sentence, just like that. When I do that, how do you add the tilde? It's not true that Janet will make jello if and only if it's Tuesday. Well, the easy and obvious thing to do is to put a tilde outside parentheses like that. And this is perfectly 100% correct, and you could do it for any of these three formulas. But it turns out that when you think about the double arrows, what we're saying is it's false that there's a correlation between the parts. Well, it turns out the only way for it to be false that there's a correlation is that if J is false, T has to be true. And if J is true, T has to be false. So it turns out that both of these symbolizations are actually equivalent to that originalist symbolization that had the tilde outside parentheses. All three of these mean the same thing. Now there's something rather deeply unintuitive about this. If it's false that there's a correlation, it means that there has to be a negative correlation. There's a way in which that makes sense, and there's a way in which it doesn't, and when we talk about truth tables, we'll need to face up to some of the, the peculiarities about the double arrow in terms of its meaning. But in terms of symbolization, this is great news. If this sentence shows up on a test, well, it would be very hard to get it wrong. Okay, that's the basic information out of the way. Let's look at these first two sentences. Number one, allow yourself treats if and only if you promise to eat slowly and absolutely enjoy every bite. Well. Here we have an if and only if, so that's going to be our double arrow as the main connective. And then we've got treats on one side, and on the other side we have eat slowly and absolutely enjoy every bite. 
and you know could hardly be easier. Do we need parentheses? Absolutely. The if and only if needs to be the main connective. Of course, yes, you could put E and B on the front side and T on the back side. That would be just fine. You could actually do this with an ampersand and two single arrows. Sentence number two. Sentence number two is another if and only if. So let's get out that double arrow. But this one has got three negations. It's false that, won't, and don't. Well, the easiest thing to do is just to say we have you will pass if and only if you study. And now let's go back and we'll just put the three tildes where it looks like they belong. We've got one that's on pass, won't pass. One that's on study, don't study. And then the it's false that typically goes outside parentheses. So here's a correct way to symbolize the sentence. However, just moments ago, we talked about the fact that you can put the tildes any place you want. And so, yes, if you wanted to, you could say, well, I'm just going to stack up all three tildes outside the parentheses. Tilde, P double arrow S. Well, then we also know that you can drop tildes in pairs. So it would be okay if you just put tilde P. Oops, I can't write down that far. I'll have to do it up above tilde P double arrow S. Any of these three would be correct. And there must there's more than a half dozen other ways that you could do it. If you wanted to, you could say, well, I'm going to put two tildes on the P, and I'm going to put one on the S. Or I could put all three of them on the S, or two on the S and one outside parentheses tildes and parentheses, or tildes and double arrows, live together in perfect harmony. You can put the tildes any place you want, and as long as you have an odd number of tildes, you will get this sentence correct. These two sentences are both definitions. One of the roles of if and only if in English is to introduce a definition. This is especially important in the context of logic. Well, here's our if and only if. It says an animal is an amphibian if and only if. So I'm just going to put the double arrow for the if and only if, and then I know I'm talking about an amphibian. And what I'm doing is defining it. I'm saying, you're an amphibian if and only if, and now I'm going to give the definition. And notice that the definition is three properties. It's cold-blooded, and it hatches as an aquatic larva, and it transforms into an air-breathing adult. Amphibian, if and only if, you have these three properties. This is the way that definitions are virtually always given in English. Definitions are strings of properties. For instance, so notice, if, imagine you want to define a triangle. You would say you're a triangle, if and only if, and then a standard definition might be you have three sides and your angles add up to 180 degrees. Over and over again, definitions are sets of properties connected by ampersands. I'm making a big deal about this because we want to contrast it with sentence number four. In this sentence, we are saying an argument is valid if and only if. So once again, we're just saying valid, and now here comes the definition. But the crazy thing about the definition of validity is that it's a conditional. It says, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. The definition of most things is a string of properties connected with ampersands. The definition of validity is itself a conditional. This gets especially confusing because of its relationship to this if and only if. When you give a definition in English in conversation, you virtually never say if and only if. Instead, you would probably say an animal is an amphibian if it's cold-blooded and attaches, etc., etc. You would shorten this if and only if to just if. When you do that, it makes it sound like what the, the real problem is then when you say the definition of validity, the if that goes in that's part of the definition itself sounds like it's the if that introduces the definition. 
The bottom line is we want to be really clear that an expression of the full definition of validity really does require every single one of these ifs. You're valid if and only if. If the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. These next three sentences really just focus on some of the synonyms for the double arrow. If you know the synonyms for if and only if, then symbolizing with double arrows is really pretty easy. Here we have A is a necessary condition for B, precisely when B is a sufficient condition for A. Well, it turns out precisely when, precisely when, precisely if, exactly when, and exactly if. That's an ugly double arrow. Um, but they're all synonyms for if and only if. So if you know that, this is an easy sentence to symbolize. There's our main connective. How do we say A is a necessary condition for B? Well, remember the rule for necessary conditions. What is necessary is the consequent. We're saying A is necessary, so the symbolization here would be B arrow A. On the back side, we're saying B is a sufficient condition for A. Well, the rule for sufficient conditions says what is sufficient is the antecedent, so we get B arrow A. Well, here we have B arrow A, double arrow, B arrow A. Yep, it's not a very interesting sentence. Uh, well, in some ways it is, actually. This sentence is called a tautology. A tautology is a sentence which is always true. B arrow A always corresponds to itself, namely B arrow A. This is a concept which we'll talk about in some detail later in the semester. Number six, if they're not young and healthy, then and only then can they be captured. Well, here what we're saying is that when if goes with then and only then, this is a type of synonym for a double arrow. The double arrow is right at the then and only then, so in front of it we have not young and healthy. If there's even one of these things that is false, well, then and only then can they be captured. Not an especially difficult sentence. It's just about knowing the synonyms. Number seven, you will, do a you will do many great things, but only if you stay sharp and allow yourself to be held in someone's hand. This is, again, it's about the synonym. But only if is a synonym for if and only if. Notice if it said if but only if. You know, if that's what it said here, this obviously would be a synonym for if and only if, because but is a synonym for and. However, nobody ever says if but only if, but the truth is you actually say but only if pretty frequently. Well, every time you do, you mean a double arrow, so let's just go ahead and designate it as a synonym for if and only if, and then the symbolization is easy. G double arrow, S and H. By the way, this is the parable of a pencil. A great many things, if and only if, you stay sharp and allow yourself to be held in someone's hand. Um, easy sentence. Let's make a, a point here off to the side. We are now distinguishing three things. If, only if, and also if and only if. These three things are quite different, and we need to be careful with them. In English conversation, we don't do a very good job of distinguishing these. What's the rule for if? Whatever follows the word if or a synonym is the antecedent. Whatever follows only if or a synonym is the consequent. And of course, the rule for if and only if is the easiest one. That just says use the double arrow. And then the trick is you got to know all the synonyms. But only if is one of the synonyms for if and only if. All right, on to the next page. Sentence number eight is also about a synonym. But not unless turns out to be a synonym for if and only if. And so let's just put a double arrow here. And so the symbolization is actually just going to be S double arrow M. If you know the synonyms, this is not difficult. 
Now you might be asking though, why is but not unless? How does that mean the same thing as if and only if? Well, remember our trick for unless is to cross it off and write in if not. So what this sentence says is you can have the service, but not if not, you pay more money. <laughs> Actually, that doesn't make sense either, does it? The truth is this has never made very much sense to me. Why does but not if not mean the same thing as if and only if? My suspicion is that it's kind of a colloquial, logical expression. It's just something that we've stumbled into saying, and so we all agree on what it means, even though you know that's, it doesn't really reduce to if and only if in any obvious way. But notice, think about the meaning of the sentence. You can tell that this is what it means. You can have faster internet service, but not unless you pay more money. So if you have the faster service, did you have to pay more money? Yes. If you pay more money, would you have the faster service? Yes. So we are saying there's a correlation between them, which is exactly what this means. Now you might say to me, hey, wait a second, there's two knots here. Maybe what we should do is put tildes in front of both parts. Well, the truth is you could do that, tilde s, double arrow, tilde m, but by the principle that the tildes can go any place they want, well, we could put both of the tildes out in front, and then we could just drop them, and then we'd be back to s double arrow m. So in terms of ease, it's best just to say but not unless is another one of those synonyms that you need to memorize for the double arrow. Next sentence. This one also has an interesting synonym. IFF is sort of an, a philosophical abbreviation for if and only if. It's not a typo. It really does mean use a double arrow here. Well, so this is if and only if in the front of the sentence. But of course what it's doing is working with the comma over there to place a double arrow. Now in front of it we've got true precisely if believed. All right, precisely if is also a synonym. So what we have in the front is T double arrow B and then this if and only if goes here and we've got reality as a mental construct or C on the backside. T double arrow B double arrow C. Okay, what about parentheses? Well, Given where the comma's at, it would be quite reasonable to put parentheses right there. But here's a question. Would that be any different from putting the parentheses, say, around the back side like that? And the answer is these two sentences, formula, these two formulas, are logically equivalent to each other. So in fact, if you have a string of double arrows, just like if you have a string of ampersands, for the purposes of symbolization, we do allow ourselves to leave them out. In a proof, we'd want to have the parentheses, but in symbolization, it really is okay just to leave the, sim the, the parentheses out. This is another one of these things about double arrows, which I think is not fully intuitive, but it turns out that all three of these formulas are logically equivalent. These four sentences fit together to make an important point. Number 10, beer is both necessary and sufficient for happiness. Well, I suspect that's not a true sentence, but remember we don't care if sentences are true or false. And I hope it's obvious that the symbolization of this sentence could be just B double arrow H. If you put necessary and sufficient together, you get the double arrow. How do you symbolize beer is necessary for happiness? Well, that would be H arrow B. Necessary conditions are always backwards, so beer is necessary for happiness. And beer is sufficient for happiness would be B-R-O-H. So here's the necessary and the sufficient put together, and put together they make a double arrow. All right, number 11. It's false that beer is both necessary and sufficient for happiness. Well, it's false that, plus the necessary and the sufficient, we know that you could just put the double arrow, the tilde outside parentheses like this to negate the entire sentence. Of course, we know we can put this tilde any place we want, but here's a standard way to symbolize it. What about beer is not both necessary and sufficient for happiness? It turns out that means the very same thing as the sentence up above. So that tilde is going to go outside parentheses just like this. It's false that beer is both necessary and sufficient. Beer is not both necessary and sufficient. Yes, exactly the same symbolization. Now we get to the exciting conclusion. 
Beer is neither necessary nor sufficient for happiness. How do you want to do this one? Oftentimes people want to say, oh, well that must be a tilde on both parts. Tilde B, double arrow, tilde H. However, from what we know about tildes, we know that that would be the same thing as tilde tilde B, double arrow H, with or without parentheses, but then that would be the same thing as B, double arrow H. Well, as beer is neither necessary nor sufficient for happiness, does that mean the same thing as beer is both necessary and sufficient for happiness? And the answer is, no, it doesn't, and so none of these three work. Hmm, what are we going to do? Well, the trick in this case is that it can't actually be done with a double arrow. If you think about the two single arrows up here, what we want to do is negate both of those relationships. And so what we have to do is say tilde H arrow B ampersand tilde B arrow H. You just can't do it with the double arrow. Notice for either of these other two, 11 or 12, we could also do these with single arrows, but then what we would do is put the tilde outside the parentheses, and we would say H arrow B ampersand B arrow H on the inside. And notice this relates to something that we know about. If you think about complex negations, what we're really saying in this case is tilde P ampersand Q negate at least one of the conditions on the inside. Down here we're saying negate both of them, tilde P and tilde Q. So again, these first three can be done with double arrows, but number 13 can't be done with a double arrow. So this is kind of a tricky thing you might want to be thinking about. It's a potentially tricky test type problem. This last sentence is an especially obnoxious sentence. I'm not going to, to, to say a lot about it. Uh, it comes directly from the textbook that we're not using. And the symbolization is just these two statements, S1 and S2, are equivalent. So equivalent if and only if each one entails each other. Well, S1 entails S2. How would you write that? S1 entails S2. The turnstile is the entailment symbol. S2 entails S1 would be written this way. Well, when we've been symbolizing, we're not using entailment symbols inside of our individual sentences. And so the author has in mind that you should let this equal A and let this equal B. And therefore, the symbolization for the whole sentence should be E double arrow A and B. That's just an obnoxious sentence. I fully agree. There's nothing, this is not a good example. I put it up here so that oftentimes I just like to make a point about, hey, we have an entailment symbol, and to remind you about it. Other than that, don't worry about this particular weird sentence.